Um, welcome everyone to Data Prep Ops and the operational side of data centric AI with Dr. Jennifer Frenke. <laughs> um, Jennifer is the founder and CEO of Electio, the first startup focused on data prep ops, a term she coined to refer to a field focused on automate, automating the optimization of training a data set. Um, she and her team are on a mission to help ML teams build models with less data, leading to both the reduction of ML operations costs and CO2 emissions, and have developed technology that dynamically selects and tunes a data set that facilitates the training process of a specific ML model. Um, Jennifer has worked um, with data and ML, at ML for many years, and she is also teaching Corize's upcoming course, on data prep ops starting on February 6th. Um, so you still have time to register for that if you are interested. And with that, I will let Jennifer take it away. All right, thank you for the kind introduction, Barbara. So I'm going to go ahead and try to uh, share my screen if it, this lets me, so yes. All right, can everybody see my screen without any like Zoom weirdness going on? Yes. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So uh, good morning, everybody, or good evening, depending on where you face. So it's a pleasure to be there uh, today, right? So uh, today we're going to be discussing like uh, several pretty hot topics uh, in the space. So uh, first and foremost, we're going to discuss data prep up. So this is a term you might not be familiar with because it's uh, it's relatively new. It's something that uh, I coined a couple of years ago, but basically like this is something that uh, is speaking of speed and importance on the market. Long story short, it's like ML ops and data centric AI had a baby, right? And uh, I'll, try, I'll try to explain what exactly it is that I mean by that. Uh, but for those like more familiar with the MLOps space, you'll hear a lot of things that are also relevant to things you work with on a daily basis and uh, data-centric AI, which is like a, uh, also a relatively new concept, which has, uh, has been made like a, a more like a preeminent uh, on the space, thanks to Andrew Ring, who mentioned the term or started like basically like a, uh, discussing the term a lot, uh, maybe like 18 months or two years ago, right? I mean, so Today we'll discuss how this all fits together and specifically we'll discuss like uh, if you're one of those who want to do uh, you know, data, data centric AI, you will see that it's, it requires uh, the creation of pipelines just the same way that you need pipelines to create a machine learning model. So that's, that's what we're going to discuss today. All right, so before going into the very details of what data prep ops actually is and how it relates to data centric AI, I'd like to start by trying to give some clarity on where is data prep ops uh, in the machine learning space and the infra infrastructure space today. Right? So I'm sure pretty much everybody on this call is familiar with MLOps, right? Uh, but sometimes we, when we think of MLOps, we don't necessarily think about the history of why MLOps became so important for data scientists and machine learning engineers, right? So I, I'll start with that, right? I mean, so the story goes like this. So when I started my career uh, about 10 years, uh, a little bit over 10 years ago, right? I mean, so uh, the industry was hiring people uh, a little bit with my profile with a PhD in uh, applied science or math or statistics or whatnot, right? Uh, and they were expecting us to build models, like a uh, fun part usually they expected us to build models without uh, proper data or data pipelines in place, but that's that's a separate story, right? Uh, but basically it was like relatively easy for uh, people with my profile to build models, uh, even though there was no PyTorch back in the days, like TensorFlow was a barely a nascent technology or whatnot, right? I mean, so basically like a, you were pretty much on your own when you wanted to like implement a machine learning model and you had oftentimes to go all the way to the basics right? uh, and, and, and completely build everything from scratch. Right? Uh, the problem that we all had was we did not know how to deploy to production. right? And so basically because uh, not being trained as a data engineer was making it really hard to understand like a, microservices and then Kubernetes came out, uh, Docker came out and then 
we had to start picking up on those things, but uh, it was really hard for uh, basically like uh, organizations to find people who could both build outstanding models and basically figure out how how to support those models in production. So that that was the original mission of MLOps, right? I mean, MLOps was really there for facilitating basically like uh, the the hard engineering stuff. So the very first MLOps companies that you can think of were typically like helping with the deployment part and the scaling part, right? And then uh, little by little, like the space matured, right? And so basically like uh, other companies and other solutions started popping up where uh, we try to provide like basically like uh, additional tools to help people like uh, monitor their models. Like if you think of the company like weights and biases or uh, they're, they're gonna they're gonna do lots of things to help you like uh, understand like uh, how to best tune your uh, your parameters to understand like the evolution of your your the parameters of your model and whatnot right I mean companies like a uh, uh, CGOPT which has now been acquired by Intel had like a different like a uh, kind of problem to solve which was to uh, help with hyperparameter tuning so that you did not have to do that manually or whatnot right I mean so. Today, you could say like ML ops is a relatively mature space, even though it's a relatively it's still relatively new, right? Uh, but it's it's essentially made like super super easy or a lot easier than it used to be to develop and uh, code a machine learning model. Right? Now, as data experts and machine learning experts, we know that the coding side, the modeling side, is just part of the story because when you're gonna want to build and train a machine learning model. Of course, you need the model, but you also need the training data to go into this model, right? Uh, and so today we are in a situation where uh, it's, it's kind of weird because on the one hand, we believe that the data space or the data ops space is very mature because uh, you have like a, amazing companies like Databricks, like Snowflake that provide like a very solid scalable solutions for uh, the storage of data and the secure storage of data. So basically like a, no matter how large your data set, typically it's relatively easy to uh, basically like a, put that data somewhere. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we discussed MLOps. So it's like relatively easy today to have like a, a machine learning model, sometimes even in the form of APIs, which you can just like a, a retrain or whatnot. But then you have this huge gap in the middle, right? I mean, so basically, and the gap is, okay, I have raw data. How do I prepare this data into something that can be uh, can be fed and can be uh, used in order to train my machine learning model, right? And so that's something that everybody knows needs to be done. In fact, there is a lot of talk about like a high quality training data or whatnot. Everybody knows that you can just like take the pictures that your autonomous vehicle like uh, basically gathered like uh, while, uh, while it was uh, driving around the streets of San Francisco to be to be put into your machine learning model. Uh, but th there's actually like no pipeline, no best practices. It's just something that has been forced onto us and that usually data scientists don't enjoy that much, right? I mean, and so that includes things like, uh, of course, like the annotation of the data set, like, uh, uh, deciding which augmentations to apply, whether you want to apply augmentations on it. Uh, it includes like synthetic data generation because you might want to use like a synthetically generated data. And so uh, even more so in the age of the nascent age of uh, generative AI, right? Uh, and, and other things that people don't talk that much about, like for example, data creation, which is basically like uh, uh, removing from your data set what can be potentially harmful, hurtful to your training process or just doesn't doesn't necessarily make sense or help, right? Uh, and so so basically like data prep ops fits exactly in that middle, right? I mean, so it's like really the piece that fits between data ops and ML ops at the same time at this, uh, at, uh, on both sides, right? I mean, at the same time, there is a little bit of overlap, right? And so uh, as I'll try to explain, data prep ops also achieve something pretty amazing, which is to consider like, um, uh, data data preparation basically as something that can be done on the fly as you train your machine learning model. But this is all providing that uh, you have the pipeline to do that. So that's that's basically like the 
the context of what data prep ops is, right? And so, so hopefully I gave you a good idea of like what uh, data prep ops is in terms of like a, uh, a space, a new nascent field, right? I mean, so, uh, but now I'd like to try to, uh, try to tie that back to data centric AI, right? I mean, so you don't like uh, assume like uh, you don't even need to remember what I just said, right? I mean, so now let's let's try to like uh, build some better understanding of data centric AI, right? So data centric AI is the term that you probably saw on social media and uh, also something that you probably uh, related to human in the loop, data labeling or whatnot, right? I mean, so one of my goals today is to prove that uh, human in the loop is only a small piece of what data centric AI is. And so uh, uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll, you'll be convinced, right? But so first let's try to understand what model centric uh, machine learning or AI actually means, right? So if you've built like any model ever in your career, you know that building a machine learning model like is very grounded in the concept of uh, feedback loops, right? I mean, so basically like so. When you, you analyze like the way that you train a machine learning model, right? Uh, normally what you do is like first, you're going to collect your data set and then you're going to spend some time on that data set. Basically, that data set is going to represent like a, 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 some sort of bottleneck for the rest, right? I mean, so basically, like in your mind at that stage, you should think of it as something without which you cannot even get started, right? I mean, because you cannot, you cannot even uh, start doing feature engineering or anything like that if your data isn't ready available and whatnot, right? Uh, and so if your data is unstructured, so if it's images, video, text, and whatnot, right, uh, your problem is even worse because you need to get that data annotated before you can start, right? If you work with small data sets, chances are you're going to be asked or you're going to decide to do that on your own. And whoever has done that before knows it's not fun to do it and it's relatively complicated. Those who haven't assumed it's easy, I'll show you later uh, how complicated it can get, right? Uh, but then eventually, like, uh, like other options you have as well is you can outsource the annotation process to a third party called the labeling company. So you can think of label box, scale AI, cloud factory, app and right? I mean, which are the big players in the space. Uh, but then you have to wait on them, right? I mean, so it's that sort of like a service kind of solution where uh, you, you don't have a clean way to uh, ask for status of your jobs and the sort of things, right? I mean, so anyways, right? I mean, so the data preparation part is low tech. It's painful. It's something we don't enjoy, but this is something that we know needs to be done and needs to be done right. right? But then when you have the data back in a model centric approach, what you're going to do is like, you're going to put your training data set through your model you're going to run your validation process on it. You're going to see what's going on, right? I mean, and so depending on the results of the validation process and the validation accuracy or whatever uh, performance metric you're looking at, you're going to ask yourself, do I want to keep going or do I, do I consider like this is good enough for what I'm trying to achieve, right? Uh, and so usually you have several iterations. You can that this is when you're going to tune your hyperparameters if you're working with deep learning. This is where you might decide to change your architecture. You might even decide to change your algorithm or whatnot, right? Uh, guess what? You can use like lots of like really great machine learning uh, or ML ops tools to help you make that decision. But there is an iterative process. And if you note here, you never iterate on the data, you iterate on the model and the model's parameters, right? So this is what model centric AI actually is, right? I mean, so it's like really like a uh, putting like the model as a first class citizen and basically considering the data is a, almost an afterthought or uh, or not necessarily an afterthought because it comes first, but uh, you you treat the data as a static object, right? Now, of course, you, you sort of see where this is going, right? I mean, so data centric AI is sort of the opposite, right? I mean, so basically like a, uh, what you do there, and so the, the nascent field of, uh, and the nascent like a uh, spirit of data centric AI is basically believing that, wait a second, what if I could touch my data set, right? I mean, so basically like, uh, uh, what if I could, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, annot like change my annotations on the fly, what if I could select data on the fly or whatnot, right? I mean, so basically like uh, uh, all of the sudden, instead of like treating data as like a, 
one time thing, uh, you know, like basically object that is static, that is, you know, like a, almost a liability to work with. You're treating data as the one thing that you want to tune, right? And so you actually do exactly the opposite, which is uh, you take your data as is, right? And so typically it's, uh, it's, it's raw, right? Uh, on the other end, you kind of trust your model already. This is very typical of what you would do if you're retraining the model after it's been in production. So think of, uh, you know, like a ML observability or whatnot, right? I mean, so you already trust your model. You've already done feature engineering on it, right? And, so, and now you want to, you want to basically like uh, add additional data on top of uh, on top of everything else, right? Uh, and uh, basically, like you want to, you know, like massage this data and tune this data, which is a brand new concept. Uh, as you as you train your machine learning model, right? I mean, and so uh, which one is best? I mean, it depends on the circumstances. It's super important and it's it's super like unique that we're finally thinking about data as something that can be optimized and changed and you know, like uh, uh, improved and curated and whatnot, right? I mean, uh, eventually, I think the right answer is to think of both the same way, where Whenever you go through these situations, um, uh, iterations, you actually you, you actually have no reason to believe that you should just iterate on the data or just iterate on the model. So basically, like hopefully, at some point we're able to do both. Of course, doing both at the same time is relatively tricky. Right? So you've seen like this this uh, diagrams like before, which hopefully like gives you a better idea. Uh, but practically what it means for you as somebody who is going to train a machine learning model, right? I mean, so it's basically like, a, uh, again, it's a cycle, right? I mean, so basically like a, just the same way that you used to do with models, right? I mean, so basically like at each loop, you assess the state of the model, typically by looking at the, the, the performance metrics, right? And then instead of making changes to the model, you alter the data, right? Uh, and then once you have altered the data, you retrain, you repeat, right? And even until you're satisfied with the results or you run out of time, you run out of budget, right? Uh, now, I say specifically alter the data and not annotate because there are countless many different ways to alter, modify your data, your records, right? I mean, so uh, one thing we're gonna see later, which is also a big part of the uh, of the course we're gonna we're gonna be teaching starting from next week is the selection of records, right? I mean, so basically, like there's this concept called active learning, which we'll uh, we'll deep dive into, uh, which basically tells you like uh, which records you should select from a larger pool of unprocessed, unprepared data, right? Uh, but you can also so think of like altering the data as an opportunity to apply augmentations on all the data on part of the data condition on certain number of things right you can think of you know like a, that that alteration process as you know like a feedback process to decide what to collect more of uh, what to generate more of actually like basically with the new capabilities in a uh, synthetic data generation this is also a possibility right uh, you can think of you know like a, basically if you select the data you're going to have to annotate that data but you can also think of modifying the label so basically maybe capturing mistakes that have been being made so far right I mean so how you identify those uh, those mistakes is also something that can be uh, that can be automated and that can be like uh, structured like more than just like uh, looking looking by hand right uh, and finally something that people usually don't think about you can also remove records right I mean so basically if you see that should there is part of the data that actually seems to to uh, bias my process or whatnot, right? I mean, if you have the right process to do this, like changing the data might also mean that you want you want to take something out, right? And so uh, this is typically not something that uh, people who promote the use of data centric AI talk about that much. So uh, all right, so let's talk about like so so hopefully like now like uh, you understand what data centric AI is, right? Uh, you're understanding that it's more than what you're just like set to read out there because it's not just about labeling. It's not just about uh, active learning. It can be a mix of different things. And hopefully you also realize that since you're gonna have to do that iteratively, well, you're gonna need like some good pipelines to version, to maintain, to keep track of what's going on, to keep track of the version of the model you've been using because you keep, uh, making changes to that model and whatnot, right? And so all of the, all of those problems, right? I mean, basically like right now, 
you don't really like have operational support or pipelines to help you do data centric AI, which is why very few people get to actually try. And so data prep ops is basically the answer to this question. Uh, so now let's talk about data labeling, because of course, in spite of everything I said, data labeling uh, or data annotation remains like a very important critical part of uh, the data centric AI process, right? Uh, and so I, I'll, st I'll start by saying this, right? I mean, so usually people who are not professional annotators or who haven't annotated data for themselves believe like basically like how hard can it be to annotate data? You have a picture, uh, you have a picture of a dog, how hard is it to mark this image as a dog, right? Uh, so it sounds very easy on the paper, if for no other reason, like basically you could you could obviously convince yourself that when you have to repeat this on, uh, you know, like a, a hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands of records, it would take some time, you, 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 would, you would understand what the problem is. In practice, like we don't work like in industry with pictures of cats and dogs, right? And then so usually you work with something like this, which would be a typical data uh, record like you would get for, uh, you know, like basically a defense use case where I don't like basically like a, a one army is trying to like a, a keep track of like, you know, like a, the, which planes that they have are currently on the floor or keep track of the, the fleet of like a, uh, an enemy army or whatnot, right? I mean, you're going to have something like this, right? I mean, so basically like a, uh, I challenge anyone to try to mark bounding boxes on every single one of those planes. Uh, I, I've tried many times and I gave up every single time after 10 minutes of trying to like a very diligent hit mark every single plane because every single one of those dots here are a small plane, right? Uh, the resolution is not that great, so it's very difficult to do it precisely or whatnot, right? And yet, if you want to train your machine learning models with it, you're going to have to do that, not just once, but for every single record that is being captured. And so even when you use a third party labeling company to do this for you, uh, number one, it's going to take time. You're going to have like extremely hard like uh, time, like guaranteeing that they did it correctly. Right. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I mean, it's going to be very expensive at the end of the day. So. All right, so basically, like, let me let me just like uh, okay. So um, this is like a little example of like uh, just to show you like how even more simple kind of use cases might actually turn out to be pretty complicated, right? I mean, so that first image here, right? I mean, so let's say I have an explicit mention that I need to annotate like all the people on the picture, so. You have people in the bus, right? I mean, so basically whether or not you should annotate people on the bus is a separate question. Should I annotate the actress on the on the poster? I mean, not quite sure whether you should or should not, right? Uh, the truth is if you're not the user of the data, it's very difficult to decide whether or not you should do it, right? I mean, and so uh, it sounds like a very simple image with not that much going on and yet, uh, you can very easily get it wrong, right? I mean, because there are many circumstances where somebody might mean like people to be pedestrians, like maybe people in, in like vehicles, like for example, if I work on autonomous driving, I don't need to know the people inside the bus because what matters is the vehicle as a whole, right? <coughs> All right, so you have this other example here, like same story, like annotate the people. Okay, and we are gonna annotate the uh, the men uh, in the, the red hat in the middle, like that's pretty obvious, right? Uh, you could also have challenges where you don't know if you should just annotate the face or annotate the entire body. If you don't know if this is a, uh, a picture that's meant for facial recognition or something else, right? Uh, but more importantly, should you annotate the, the 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 people in the work arts, right? I mean, so this is also something that needs to be uh, identified, right? Okay, how do I how do I do this? Right? So like the, this example here, right? I mean, so annotate the boats. So here you have a problem because the boats are reflections on this car's uh, window, right? Uh, so it's kind of the same story than basically the bus, right? I mean, because like a, if I want to generate more information for the model to learn, I might want to annotate the boats that I see in there, uh, especially if uh, the boats are very scarce in my data set. But technically, 
uh, in a context of real life, like a, uh, like autonomous vehicle detection, uh, this is completely irrelevant, right? I mean, so whether or not you should annotate this is a separate question as well. Uh, here you have a problem where, you know, like, uh, I don't think like technically, like there's an issue whether these shapes here should be considered people, but it's just very blurred out, right? I mean, so it's extremely difficult to come up with like a, a decent, like basically, um, uh, you know, like a, a limit or whatnot, right? Uh, this is kind of a fun one, right? I mean, so same story is like, uh, where, like, where does the cat start? Do you want to annotate the, like, especially for the reflection, is this a cat? Is it a, is it a little girl? Is it both? Do I use the seat boxes, etc. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, another example that, uh, you know, like basically we can easily see whether clearly like to us humans, like these are two separate cats, but how do you annotate this? Do you put two different boxes here? Uh, do you do, do you basically try to annotate the whole thing? Like probably not a good idea. So remember that at the end of the day, so when you annotate data like this, like if you are the data scientist who's gonna use the data, it's relatively like, straightforward for you to decide like here no, given my model given the weakness of my model this is how i need things done but in practice if you ship that to somebody else you're going to have to be very clear very explicit about how to do things right and so uh the problem is like none of those best practices is really common in industry just yet and usually people just like send their their you know like uh, data sets like saying like a uh, please annotate all cars for me. And it's not that clear, like how this, like a, what exactly your car is. Does a toy car mean like a, a count as a car or whatnot, right? Even for something like this, like in the case of object detection, like exactly marking the limits, like basically depends on uh, whether you want a high, uh, a high, you know, like um, high precision or high recall for your data set. The person who's gonna take care of the annotations for you is not necessarily gonna know that. Right? So let's talk about like basically like so I'm sure you're convinced like still at this stage that you know like uh, okay there are still labeling companies I can make it clear enough for them but I have a huge problem and we should all showed like basically that data labeling as a service the way we're processing like data to to get ready for for training it just doesn't work and then it's not just because uh, it's hard it's expensive and it's slow right it's just that there's no operational side to it, right? I mean, so basically like first and foremost, when you send data to, let's say like a, a cloud factory or label box, uh, they won't do that hard, like uh, in real time for you, right? I mean, so if you need this very quickly, if you need that to be done, like, a, uh, you know, like a, as your model trains and specifically in the context of active learning or whatnot, uh, they won't be able to do that for you. In fact, I have many circumstances where uh, people have been reporting, they don't even get an acknowledgement that the request was sent, right? I mean, so if you need that in a timely manner, because you have a model in production, that model needs to be retrained, it, it's typically not going to happen uh, unless you use some sort of auto-labeling. So basically like a third part, like a auto-labeling being uh, the use of a machine learning model for uh, the annotation of a data set. So when you should or you shouldn't, you shouldn't use like auto-labeling auto is also something we, we will discuss during the course, right? Uh, labeling as a service has like very poor transparency. So unfortunately for the people who've been in that space, right? I mean, so basically like uh, you probably had circumstances where you send some amount of data, and somebody gave you a quote that you know, like this was going to cost like $12,000 or whatnot. And then you actually get the bill and it's much higher because they had to re-annotate it many times or they realized the data was more dense in information than what you thought. So uh, usually you have a lot of bad surprises. You often have bad surprises with data quality. It's extremely difficult for them to provide like a proper data quality measurement and whatnot. So same thing like where we were gonna discuss like basically like how do you know whether you can trust or not what comes back from a labeling company. Right? Uh, one very important part of that conversation is the problem of workflow. So the way you do things today is you would normally dump your data in a, in a storage somewhere in a Google Drive and you would send that link to your labeling company, right? And uh, you don't know when they're going to get back to you, but so you have no way to keep track of what's going on. and. We all wish as ML ops people that basically like the data that was already annotated automatically comes back so that it can start being fed into the into the process, right? I mean, and so 
why no one ever built this kind of capability is, is kind of surprising, but it really comes from the fact that we paid a lot of attention to basically like a, a building, automating the creation and the tuning of machine learning models and not so much on the data side. Right? Uh, then there's something I call like a optimal resource allocation, right? I mean, so basically like a, when should you pick like an expensive data labeling process because some companies are more accurate, but they're more expensive. Some companies are cheaper, but you, you take more risk or whatnot. So sometimes uh, the trade-off is not worth it, right? I mean, so basically how to make those decisions is also uh, something that, you know, like if you just pick one labeling company randomly, like you're not gonna be able to, to, to assess properly, right? Uh, we talked about like accessibility and flexibility. I, my belief is most of the large, large labeling companies are general, they're generalists, right? I mean, so basically like a, if you want to annotate like autonomous driving data, it's fairly straightforward, right? I mean, because they can hire like a, a lot of like, you know, like basically like the barrier to entry to become an annotator for identifying what a car or a cat is, is very low, right? But if you need to annotate like records that are, you know, like let's say an X-ray or um, uh, the video of an open heart surgery, you're gonna need experts to do that for you, right? And so typically uh, the thing is like, usually like there are more niche companies that can do that like very very well because they hire doctors or they have relationships or like experts in the field which the typical large labeling companies don't right i mean so basically like uh, there, there's the true benefit in uh, you know like working sometimes with a more specialized kind of a kind of a systems right and so finally like uh, uh there's the whole space of like auditing and repairing the annotations uh, I've I've worked like I've been the VP of machine learning for uh, a large labeling company. I guarantee you that basically like a no annotation job is ever perfect, and it's not easy and sometimes more difficult to basically like a, uh, assess how well it was done as opposed to actually doing it. Right? I mean, and so as you can guess, like it's best that this process is outsourced and not like provided by the labeling company itself because. Uh, of course, they have no incentive to report their own mistakes. Right? So, so all of this operational side, like how do you create an end to end? Uh, how do you pick the right labeling company? Like basically, like uh, how do you measure labeling quality? Right? I mean, basically, like how is labeling quality going to impact your uh, your training process, which is very important, right? I mean, so all are all of those things are things that. Uh, require the existence of an end-to-end -end pipeline, require engineering, and require data prep ops. So basically, that's a, another uh, another discussion to have. So let's let's talk about active learning. So active learning is like a full week of course, like basically on like a, what exactly it is. Uh, it's becoming like relatively popular, but oftentimes people don't realize like how uh, how many different flavors of active learning exist. Right? I mean, so. So the good news is like active learning is something you can use today and it's actually relatively easy except for the operational side, right? But so at a very high level, like basically active learning is like a, a semi-supervised learning technique, which means like um, originally it was built to help solve a very specific problem, which was to reduce the volume of uh, labels that are data or records you're gonna have to annotate, right? I mean, so assume you have a, 100,000 pictures, you cannot pay for those 100 pictures to be annotated. How do you pick the ones that are the most valuable or the most impactful for your model? So this is the problem activity is trying to solve, right? And so the way you do this is like, you start small, you pick up a sample, which is basically what's uh, you know, like, uh, uh, described here. So uh, in, in sequences, which we call loops, right? I mean, so basically out of your 100,000 pictures, you pick a thousand, you annotate this 1000, that becomes your training set. Uh, certainly a small training set in the beginning, right? Then you train your model. And once you've trained your model, of course, you, being like a, a good machine learning scientist, you would know that there is no way you can trust this model to be highly accurate, but you have a state for that model, which you can use to basically like a, guess what you should pick next right i mean so basically like so this is exactly what active learning does so uh it's basically like a growing a high, high like basically a data set on steroids by uh using like like a, a incremental and sequential training processes right i mean so it comes with lots of different problems where 
you need to version the data set you need to keep track of like what you what you already used what you didn't use you need to keep track of the version of the model you last use you can basically then start looking into later the evolution of your parameters and whatnot right uh and uh but apart from that right like the key part to active learning is like okay once i have like model n how do i basically like uh, make a decision for which data i should include in the next loop right and so this process is called the querying strategy uh and there are practically infinitely many querying strategy even everybody if everybody uses something called the least confidence query strategy so when you should use like which query strategy is another very interesting part of the uh, of, uh, uh, data prep ops basically process, right? So look, I, I, I told you it was simple. I promise it's simple. Basically like what is difficult is like every single part separately, right? But so active learning is really like a, you have your model, you have your raw data set. Uh, you put your model through this uh, uh, iterative successions of retraining, right? Uh, but then so it's, it's, a, it's a simple su succession of like, selecting some data how is basically like a, where it takes more expertise right annotating this data training and basically like a inferring to try to analyze the state right i mean so as i explained like the selection process is called the query strategy uh the labeling part so everybody thinks of this as human in the loop but you could technically use uh, an automated process as well so there is no reason why active learning is actually a human in the loop process it doesn't need to be right uh, the problem, though, is because you're doing things in a continuous manner, you need continuous labeling. So that's that's something that uh, is, is slowly popping up in the in the industry as well. But your typical labeling company does not annotate the data continuously for you, right? I mean, so basically, uh, if you want to like uh, retrain your model in fifty different successions, you cannot afford like a, a full week to go by. Uh, in between every single process, right? Uh, so basically, like then the interesting part is like when you you do like you want to do a more sophisticated version of active learning, then um, you're going to train your model and you're going to infer on the data which hasn't been used, right? And so taking back my example, if you had a hundred thousand pictures, you first select a thousand, you have ninety nine thousand which haven't been annotated, but which you can use to validate your model except that wouldn't really be a validation because you don't have the annotations but you can use the the inference process to basically like a take a guess and make a prediction of like a, what what you should actually do next right i mean so so this is basically what should make you feel like very excited about learning more about active learning because usually people feel like i've tried active learning because i've tried least confidence but there are infinitely many different flavors because going back to my step before, right? Uh, this selection process really can be an algorithm of, of any kind, right? I mean, it can be a machine learning model, it can be a reinforcement learning model, it can be like a, a manual selection process or whatnot. But obviously, when you have like a, you know, like in my case, 99,000 records remaining to pick up from, you have many, many different combinations of the data that you could use. And so, uh, obviously the training process is going to go differently depending on what you do, right? And so this is like a, a sort of an example of, you know, like a, a different strategies, right? I mean, so basically what uh, Alectio actually does is like try to uh, find the very best like querying strategy that you can think of or that the, for your specific model, knowing that it's never going to be the same one. It's going to depend on the size of the data set. It's going to depend on the on the type of model and whatnot, right? But just just have a look at this to see like how much difference you can have from uh, one querying strategy to another one. This is all the same model in the same data set, right? I mean, so you have this like energy approach, which is the blue curve over here, which uh, our algorithm picked because like uh, obviously it's much more stable, it's much stronger. It even achieves something very interesting where you can see like the accuracy that you get with only a fraction of the data is actually stronger than what you can get in the end, right? I mean, so basically like a, so this is like kind of like a very bold statement, but uh, active learning, which was originally designed and meant for people to reduce their labeling cost, technically can be used to boost the performance of the model, right? I mean, and so uh, this is this is where I feel like uh, there is like more education needed on the market, right? Uh, so 
add Alexio and when I talk about those topics, I usually don't talk about uh, active learning as active learning because active learning is really like the vanilla version where you use an arbitrary rule for the squaring strategy, right? I mean, so it's not something we invented, but so the, the basic like active learning on steroid is something we call data curation. Data curation is essentially like a algorithm uh, algorithm driven uh, active learning where your querying strategy can learn can change through time and whatnot right but so just to discuss like the benefits of like doing uh, active learning or data curation right i mean so as we said like originally that was for saving on data labeling which can be like a really awesome if you're working with like a, a point cloud data or something that requires a lot of expertise right uh, it does not sound obvious at first, but you can also save on computational resources. That one is kind of tricky because like typically you keep retraining the model with increasingly large data set by forgetting the weights every single time. But so uh, there are many different ways you can solve this problem and actually like, get to the point where uh, you also save like some, uh, some money on, on compute by using active learning if you do it right. Uh, so save on operational cost, generally speaking, right? I mean, so uh, that's, that's what we discussed, right? Uh, so basically, like, so reduce training time, right? I mean, so basically, like, if you have a uh, hundred thousand pictures that uh, you're going to train, like, uh, over the course of like a uh, three hundred epochs, it can take a certain amount of time. If you can, like, really quickly select like the part of the data that matters, then technically you should be able to be done much faster, which is also killing for retraining models in production or whatnot, right? Uh, all right, so next, like, so boost model performance. This is what I just explained before, right? I mean, so so it's it's it sounds really weird. I know it's a complete, like, shift from the traditional approach, which tells you, like, the more data, the better generalization, the better the model, right? Uh, but technically, like, there are many circumstances where, uh, for example, like, uh, this is something we'll discuss as well, uh, there is a concept known as catastrophic forgetting, which is essentially like whenever you basically like you you push the model into or outside of its comfort zone by showing data that's too unique, too difficult, or too much of a corner case or whatnot, then it tends to unlearn, right? I mean, so basically like a, so if you can prevent this from happening, one way being like you can remove some of the data from your training set, as I explained in the beginning, uh, not only you might save money, but you might also get a better model, which is which is basically like a kind of a bold statement that by using a small fraction of the data, you get you get something that works better. Right? All right. So uh, another thing that, you know, like people don't usually use like data curation for, but you can use it for diag like the diagnosis of issues. So, for example, uh, we've had customers who by using active learning realize that all of the data that was coming from like camera number seven, right? I mean, which was placed like uh, in the building or whatnot was always harmful to a model, right? Because you would you would clearly see that the active learning process is trying to reject this, right? Uh, and guess what? They realized that there was a problem with the way that the camera was set up, right? I mean, so basically like, a, uh, so you can diagnose like a, uh, data collection like pro like problems you can diagnose like problems with the uh, with the model as well right I mean so basically just realize that you know like uh, uh, the model is not deep enough because it's not making sense uh, of like uh, the you know like basically like the the the, the hardest data or whatnot like we've seen things where uh, things to active learning people realize they need to merge like two different classes and this sort of things. So. Uh, and so finally, like last time but not least, like there's a lot of talk about model explainability, model understandability, but so something very unique that's achieved by active learning as well is basically like a, since you're ordering the data throughout the process, if you can trust the order in which the data was selected, you can then start looking into like a correlations between like, for example, if I see that my model stopped learning at the point when uh, the density are of uh, like small cars in my object detection problem, like basically like I started disappearing. Then I know exactly like how the model is learning, uh, what it needs to learn quickly, and this sort of thing. So this is this is kind of a, you know like basically like a explainability in the sense that you don't just explain the prediction, but you explain like which part of the data was responsible for 
uh, a specific parameter to be learned or so a specific like a specific model to uh, retain like a, a, a given information. Yeah. All right, so basically like I uh, don't have much time left, so I want to uh, leave a couple of minutes for uh, for questions, but basically like so the thing is that you can create a pipeline to do it all in one place and that's again what data purpose is right and this is something we've done it's by no means the solution this is like basically to me like data prep ops is literally to data preparation what ml ops is to model building so it's going to take time it's going to take a lot of expertise it's going to take a lot of research for people to build more efficient faster pipelines and whatnot right but so uh, we've done it, we've learned a lot from it, and basically like a, a week four of the course is going to be like a, you know, like a showing like how you can do it or how you can build the first version for your specific use case, right, and basically like a, uh, actually like have a pipeline that helps you do like a, a data tuning and data centric AI uh, in, in practice, right, I mean, so basically like a this is like basically like a, I'm just going to go through this very quickly, right? But basically like this is like a, the workflow that we've built, right? I mean, uh, so one of the core IP of the company is like a, the machine learning driven selection engine where we automatically tune the querying strategies so, so that you don't have to worry about this. But uh, a big part of the puzzle is also like a, making labeling happen in a continuous manner, deciding whether or not you should use like a, uh, a machine learning model to generate your predictions, pre-generate your predictions. We basically have pipelines for validating the annotations, sending them back when they seem to be faulty so that you don't have to, to try to review your data manually and whatnot, right? Uh, and yeah, I mean, so basically like we'll, we'll show you everything, we'll show you what we've done uh, and we'll, we'll show you how you can do that for yourself, so. All right, so anyway, right? I mean, so I'm reaching the end of the course, right? I mean, so basically like uh, obviously uh, the, the talk, right? I mean, so uh, if you have questions about like, how do you build the perfect querying strategy? Like uh, why is active learning not that popular? How do I use active learning without necessarily like uh, uh, breaking the bank? Like which lab libraries can I use? Is it, is it recommended for an LP? Is it recommended for, you know, like a computer vision? We'll cover all of this. Uh, we'll cover the best practices for data labeling. We'll cover like uh, how you can choose the best uh, labeling company and whatnot. But basically like the bottom line is like, uh, you should not be left on your own devices when you prepare data. Preparing a training data set is very complicated. It deserves to be treated as such. It is something that requires like a, best practices like engineering knowledge uh scalable pipelines and whatnot right i mean so uh our goal is to make people stop basically like uh, doing that in their own uh, in their own little corner and feel like uh, you know like this is just something that needs to get through in fact we're hoping to see the same evolution in uh, data preparation as we've seen in model building in the past few years so. all right i'm gonna stop now so uh yeah, Barbara, if you want to take yeah. over, like I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Sure. Um, awesome. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A or put them in the chat. Um, and we'll take about two or three minutes to answer questions now. Um, and if you are interested in what you're hearing from Jennifer, feel free to check out her Data Prep Ops course. Um, launching on Monday on CoRISE, and she'll definitely get more into the nitty gritty details. I will drop the link in the chat um, for all of you to see that. And if you, uh, I think this is only, I will follow up with the link to everyone who attended um, via email after this, because I don't think you can access the chat. Oh no, yes, you can. And um, Jennifer, I see one question in the chat, um, which is saying is really interesting. So can we have the video after this event? We will be following up with the recording of this event. All right, awesome. And if no one has any questions, you can feel free to follow up with us via Slack. Um, and yeah. All right, thanks Barbara. So we're very excited like, to give this course. And so hopefully like this is just like a teaser for 
all of the details like i'm specifically like very excited for uh for the active learning part, part of the talk so basically active learning is something that's gotten like very popular recently so if you want to know like everything about like uh, different flavors of like a uh, querying strategy how do you smartly select how do you avoid biases or whatnot this is a big big part of the course all right awesome bye everyone thank you so much for joining us